below. Yeah. Come in. Just just see you. Apple, you are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Come for in. having us in. Thank you so much. How do you come up with a private eye cover like those? Well, this was when Theresa May, who, uh, who do you remember her? She was, she was around at the beginning of the year. Um, she used to be Prime Minister. Anyway, uh, she left and we had to think, how can we um, pay tribute um, to Mrs May? So I thought perhaps a blank page would be good. And so we have the Theresa May memorial issue, her legacy in full. And just think what I'm saying, uh, thank you. Which again, seems quite cruel. But it was quite funny. Do you know how time. each of those? Um, do you ever keep tabs on how each of those sell? Do yeah, you know? yeah. So, do you that, that, that was a seller. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid that that was that was popular. And Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage. This is great. I mean, he's always good. Um, partly because he he always does photo opportunities. So having been accused of having a party full of fruit cakes, he does a photo op eating a fruit cake. I mean, it is fantastic. I mean. He does the joke for us, doing the facts. And you sometimes jump on anniversaries too. Yes, this is this is when Boris became um, prime minister, which many people equate with um, an event as unlikely as landing on the moon. But he did, and there's this brilliant picture of him just going into number ten. So we we did it as the moon landing, a souvenir issue, one small step for man, and a giant leap in the dark for mankind. Um, and, and, and put it in black and white. And in terms of your annual, when you've got a year to get through, you've done many of these annuals, of course. When you've got to curate a year, which is what you were saying yeah. a moment ago, is what journalism is about, what's your starting point with thinking about how we do all this? Do you just think, let's get the best jokes, or do you think we need to really reflect the year? I try and get the best jokes, um, and um, if we've been dull about a particular subject or haven't covered it well, I try and leave it out. Um, I mean, we're exhaustive, but... Um, the idea is to be entertaining. You've been personally committed, haven't you, to trying to reverse the decline of the English cartoonist. Yes. Why have you and Private Eye kept up your investment in cartoons? Um, because um, people like them and the mag sells. Um, no, obviously it's a much more elevated reason than that. No, I love cartoons and I think that one of the things that print can do is reproduce sort of beautiful drawings that are funny. and. English cartooning tradition is very old and I think absolutely remarkable. So I basically, I doubled the number of cartoons um, and people said, well, you know, there aren't any, you know, young cartoonists, you won't get anyone. It's funny, if you offer money, people become cartoonists. And we've got a brilliant raft of young cartoonists. I mean, this is a, a genuine skill and there are lots of people who do it really well. Uh, I mentioned politics, which is what most of your covers are about. Now we seem to be in an age of polarisation, don't we, and genuine differences. Why has that happened, do you think? Is it the delayed effects of a financial crash? Um, I think um, uh, the, the referendum was a question um, about, you know, whether you're essentially happy with the way Britain is or not, whether you think it's too unequal, whether you think you've been left behind by um, uh, the international um, world that has um, come into business, whether you would rather um, your life was structured in different ways. In the end, for me, it wasn't really about Europe at all. I mean, the question that people answered was a question about themselves. It's perfectly reasonable, but it didn't have anything to do with the EU. So um, we managed to politicise um, essentially a cultural divide, um, which is why we've ended up with three years of people shouting at each other. And interestingly, the last three years has furnished your covers with some very loud characters. What does that do for satire, though? Does satire become easier or harder when you have these stranger-than-life characters? Um, well, I mean, it does two things. One is, is everybody says to you, oh, well, satire's over now, because you can't satirise Trump. I mean, he's doing it to himself, or, you know, Boris is, is, is funny, you know, there's nothing more to add, um, which isn't true. Um, B, you have to work harder, um, because you have to find the areas where they're vulnerable, the areas where they genuinely are funny and where you can um, get under their skin. Um, obviously, it's incredibly flattering where um, uh, we'd done some joke about Trump, which turned up in a, um, a tweet um, saying this was sort of unfunny and un not clever and, and not funny. And that's the ultimate um, prize. And to find that Boris is furious by something, that's what you want. Does he still get, does he ever get in touch? Do his people ever get in touch? I mean, he's blessed your cover many, many, many times. Do you think Boris is still cheesed off when he sees himself, perhaps with Jennifer R. Curie on your front page? Oh, I do hope so. <laughs> <laughs> What's your technique for dealing with people who are readily offended online? Um, well, I'm not online, which helps. 
Have you found that that's hard to, su to sustain over the course of the development of the internet? You've got two uh, children in their 20s. I mean, what do they think about the fact that dad's not online? Um, I, I have no idea. I mean, presumably because I haven't looked online. Um, no, it's very restful. Uh, <laughs> I do recommend it. I think I could, um, I could get used to that idea. Unfortunately, the BBC's media editor may not be allowed uh, to do that. One of the things about um, the age in which we live is that the truth seems up for grabs yep. in a way that it has been uh, for a long time, maybe not ever in the course of your career. Do you think it's fair to say that these days the penalty or sanction faced by those caught lying has almost disappeared? There are people getting away with lying as never before. I mean, I do think it's a real problem now, I mean, the idea of, of fake news, and that's one of the things that... Um, it's why I don't spend a lot of time online, because I'm, I'm infuriated by, you know, perfectly reasonable people who say to me, huh, I noticed you didn't run that story about uh, Hillary Clinton murdering everybody. And I said, well, I didn't run it because it isn't true. Um, and they said, well, look, I read it online. Um, and these are people who, they say to you, the mainstream media, Ian, is just full of lies. And then they believe the biggest and stupidest lie that someone in a bedroom has written up on the internet and sent out as a blog. I mean, there's a real divide between a sort of um, supposedly sort of scepticism, a sort of fierce refusal to believe anything you read in the normal media, and then believing almost anything you read online. And this is weird. And, and, it, and it, 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 makes it, it makes the idea of truth polluted, which, you know, as we know from the history of fake news, this is what the original Putin doctrine was, and this is what Trump wants. He doesn't want you to believe this rubbish he pumps out. He wants you to believe nothing. And yet, I know that people watching this on the BBC or listening to this uh, via a BBC podcast will think that actually the BBC is part of the problem. That there is, you know, these days, if you want to go uh, viral, you say that there's a conspiracy of silence at the BBC. Whether or not there is one or not, why are people so keen to believe conspiracy theories about a cover-up by journalists? In other words, why is trust in journalism so low? Um, well, I mean, we haven't distinguished ourselves over the last 20 years. I mean, you know, the phone hacking thing wasn't good. The Levson inquiry was not marvellous. So, I mean, I mean, there is a reason um, for um, people to be slightly sceptical um, about journalism. But it is in much the same way as, the, you know, the, the um, uh, expenses scandal made people very sceptical about politicians. What I, I believe is that... Um, and I have said this before, but that being sceptical is not the same as being cynical. It doesn't mean you believe in nothing. Um, you try and assess and evaluate. And there is plenty of really good journalism going on. And the alternative is literally sitting at home thinking, I wonder what I believe. You said in the past you, you don't talk much about your um, uh, voting habits, but you said you're a Democrat and you believe in democracy. Yeah. As you look around the world, do you think that we're in a sort of period of democratic recession, which is just a correction, where things are being readjusted, but democracy will survive? Or do you actually think we're at the start of something darker, which is a post-democratic age? Um, no, I, don't, I mean, I don't believe that. But then I am, on the whole, quite optimistic. Um, I mean, we are in, in, in the middle of a, of a cult of the strong man, and um, uh, a lot of leadership around the world is very autocratic. And um, populist movements have, I think, done democracy no favours. Um, in forgetting um, the, uh, the normal checks and balances and the um, structures and um, sort of boring um, sets of standards and values that allow um, democracy to function. So n none of that is, is very encouraging. But essentially, I think most periods, and it's one of the good things about getting older, think this is a terrible time um, and British politics has never been so divisive. And then I think... Yeah, poll tax, riots. Um, what about the miners' strike? I don't remember that being a very cohesive period um, in British politics. Um, and, you know, I, I always uh, quote I, my mother-in-law who said to me, I, I've, I've never been so worried as I am now about the world. And I said, you were a teenager in 1939. <laughs> and she said, oh, yes, so I was. <laughs> I do think you have to keep a certain amount of perspective. I just conscious, as I say, is that I have not talked about the fact that behind you are endless, endless letters. In terms of the threats that you've had this year, yes. legal and otherwise, um, you've had many a legal letter over the course of your career. Yeah. How, is it, how does this year kind of rank in terms of the uh, threats to ruin you and your family's welfare? <laughs> it's interesting. I think that's another thing about Brexit. People must be, you know, a bit, a bit more depressed. Um, uh, we've had quite a lot of very, very rich people suing. 
we, we've what done. What sort of stuff? Um, mostly Russian um, uh, or thereabouts um, about um, money and where, why it's in London and where it's going to. So we've had quite a lot of that. Is there ever any danger that these, um, these cases are going to end up bankrupting you in private eye? Um, well, <laughs> well, I have a wooden table. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, we'll see. I mean, we 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 survive on the on the um, uh, favour of our readers. Um, they pay up. That's where our money comes from. Um, and you know, uh, most of our stories about unexplained wealth. Um, you know where ours is from. Uh, we don't know where theirs is from. So that's the difference. Ian Hislop, thank you very much indeed.